Ooh, amen, amen. I declare war, and the wolf will rise. Y'all believe that? All right. Uh, so we're in this, in this series, smack dab in the middle of this series called I Declare War, and we're looking at four keys to winning the battle within yourself. And Baker did brought an awesome message, right, during the, the, the week one, and it was all about we, we are our own worst enemies, right, man? We are real quick to beat ourselves up. We like to judge other people, but we judge ourselves really harsh. We're our own worst, worst critic. And, uh, and so we have been talking about four different keys, well, well, two different keys, but we're looking at four keys this month about what it means to win the battle within ourselves. And, and these keys come from this, this, uh, this idea of being like a wolf, and what does that mean, right? Because for a lot of us, we hear this like a wolf, and we're like, man, I don't know about that. I've heard some bad things about a wolf, right? Well, let me read you just a few facts about wolves and try and change your mind and change your pers- perspective and, and, uh, and, and your, your view of what wolves actually are and what they're about. So first thing is they care about their pups with a familiar devotion and share our reflexive instinctive care for the youngsters related or not to them. So what that means is they care for their young. Do we all care for our young? Most of the times we want to choke our young, but we care for our young. And that was a joke. We, we, we care for our young, right? They drive us nuts sometimes, but we love them and we'll do anything we can for them. And if someone comes at them, what are we going to do? Woo, I hear about mama bear, but you ain't never seen mama wolf. Guess what? In that family, in the wolf families, there's actually not one alpha, but two alphas, an alpha male and an alpha female. That's, that's how hardcore they are, right? And, and so they care about their youngsters. They care about their young. And not only their young, but other youngs, young, young cubs as well. Let's, they could be going down, doing their thing, and what happens? They see this poor little wolf out by himself instead of killing it like a lion pride would do. No, they adopt that cub in, that wolf pup, and they adopt the wolf pup in to their family and love them like their own. Not many species will do that. Why? Because the alpha male doesn't want nobody to challenge him. But wolves, actually, they do that, man. They adopt the young. They also hold a place in society for their elders. They push boundaries and explore. Then they return and visit their families, and so... Like many of our kids, I'm not there yet, but some of you guys are. At 18, usually we're like, all right, see you guys, go explore, have fun. But what do they do? They always come back to their family, and they always make time to spend with family. They are very close with their pack. They care about what happens to another. They miss each other when they are separated. They grieve for one another when one passes. They are benevolent leaders and faithful lieutenants, fierce mothers, nurturing fathers, devoted brothers. They're also hunters, adventurers, comedians, and caregivers. And so last I checked, God made the wolf, correct? And when God made the animals on whatever day it was in Genesis, what did he say? It is good, right? He didn't say all these are good except for the wolf. (laughs) He's a jerk. Watch out for him. He likes to eat little pigs. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He likes to blow down houses. He didn't say that. He said, it is good, right? But here's what happens. The enemy takes good things and makes them evil. He loves to do that. He loves to take. And, and so why wouldn't he take an amazing animal, a majestic animal who, who, who we are actually like and have a lot of characteristics like and use them for his, his evil? He doesn't want us to be like that. He doesn't want a bunch of wolves coming after him. I mean, think about it. You, you mess with a, a family of wolves and they're going to come at you. Why? Because they protect the squad. They protect their family, their pack. And so that's why we have stories today about Little Red Riding Hood and Three Little Pigs. And that's why we have those stories. Why? Because, man, the enemy wants us to think bad about a wolf. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you, man, wolves are awesome. Wolves are amazing. Just in this series, I've got to learn a lot more about them. Uh, like I talked about the, the, the packs, and, and within the pack, there's actually, I said, two alphas. Then there's a bunch of uh, betas. That they're the, like the lieutenants of the wolf clan, of the wolf crew. And then you have, you know, the worker wolves. But then you have this one wolf at the very end. 
and he's the omega. Now this, this wolf usually eats last, is last to do everything. However, this wolf is like the chief encouragement officer of the pact. If another wolf is having a bad day, this is the wolf that comes up and is like, hey guys, hey, hey, and he's trying to be the comedian. He's basically like the Mike Baker of the wolves, right? He's, he's trying to encourage, encourage the rest of the, he, they, he doesn't like to see wolves with their heads hanging down, right? And I love that about Mike because he doesn't like to see his fam with their heads hanging low, right? And so in week one, Baker brought a great message about what it meant to think like a wolf, right? What it means to think like a wolf. And we have to take our thoughts. And, we, and when we have these thoughts, these jacked up thoughts that the enemy puts in our head, we have to take them captive. We, we, we can't just let them run wild. Why? Because before you know it, those thoughts sink down into our heart and then come right back out of our mouths. And so we have to take those thoughts captive and we have to learn to think like a wolf. And that means thinking like Jesus. Because last I checked, Jesus said, hey, you have been made anew. Your mind is new because of me. And so let your thoughts be anew. So we have to think like Jesus. And then Tommy Green, man, last week, Dr. Tommy Green, he brought a great message, a very encouraging message on what it means to speak like a wolf. And we have to be careful, right? Because our words are very weighty. Our words can either bring life or they can bring death, right? And, and, and I love that he challenged us too to, uh, hey, we're, when we're in the game, we got to stop being, uh, what, what do you say, spectators and start being participators, right? For so many of us, we've gotten scared and we sat on the bench and we don't want to get on the field. And so that was very encouraging for that, right? And so this week, this week we're looking at uh, what it means to act like a wolf, to act like a wolf. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying be like how your mom or your grandma or whatever used to say, and look at this place. Are you guys raised by wolves? Right? Have I mean, you guys ever heard that? Are you raised by wolves? Right? That means the place is a mess. Contrary to popular belief, wolves are actually very clean, very neat animals. Their places are very hardly ever a mess. Why? Because they have a bunch, a, a structure in place that doesn't allow for that. So we have to act like a wolf. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Uh, but before we get there, while you guys are finding that, some of you guys are going to read it on the screen, uh, I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork, a little bit of context, because you guys need to know what, what, what's going on here in this scripture. Uh, whenever I read scripture, I, I, I filter it through three different things. What does it say? Then I read it again. What does it mean? And then I read it a third time. What does it mean to me? What is God trying to say to me in this scripture? So you need to know what it says. You need to know the context of scripture when you read it. It puts so many more, much more things. And in, 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 it's like watching a TV and you have HD channels, but you don't use the HD channels and you're watching it in black and white. And then when you finally realize your TV is actually color and in HD, you're like, how do I live without this? That's what context does for scripture. It just brings that much more clear. Um, so in Thessalonica, the town of Thessalonica, that's where these people come from, Thessalonians. Everybody say Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Yeah, man, that's a tough one, right? Whew. So in Thessalonica, Paul, the apostle Paul, he comes and he starts this, this work. He starts this church and he gets this group of, of, of brand new believers and he's mentoring in them. He's discipling them. And what happens is he, he, gets, he gets called away. He has to go. He starts with other churches. But while he's away, he gets this message that the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, have once again slipped back into their old ways. They're fighting amongst each other. They're fighting with uh, non-believers. I mean, they're just, they're, they're in turmoil. And so what Paul says, he writes this letter to him, and this is toward the end of the first letter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he says, look, this is how you're acting? Y'all are acting insane. This is, did you not forget, this is how we act. And the reason we act this way is because we've been made new. And so verse 5 starts out like this. Read off the screen for you. It says, For you are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night 
nor the darkness. So when I read this, I'm looking at this. It says, for you are all children of the light. Do you remember what Jesus said about what we should be? A house on a hill, right? A light to the world. We're not supposed to put a basket over the light. Who does that? Try and start a fire. No, who does that? Don't do that. No, let the light shine. And we are children of the light and children of the day. We don't belong to the night or the darkness. It's gone. Go ahead, verse six. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. That's a dirty word in my house, self-controlled. Um, not because we, we think that's a dirty word, but it's because we're not self-controlled, uh, especially holiday season, right? I talked about this a little earlier. Holiday season, ooh, man, when there's all kinds of goodies going on, and when your wife is baking goodies for the church, and you're trying to stay away from the goodies, and they're just sitting on the oven, cooling, and there's cold milk in the fridge, listen, that self-control is really hard. The enemy knows where to get me, and y'all can see it, right? Like, like I got, I got the, the dad bod extraordinaire going on, and that's because self-control. But hey, don't worry about it. I got some, some, some great brothers and sisters that are going to help me uh, get through that, and so uh, we're going to work on the self-control, but it, it, it's all about this discipline, and we should have self-control because people are looking at us and if we're just doing whatever we want with no control, what are they going to say, right? We're supposed to be ambassadors, examples. So let's go on to, to verse 7. It says, for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. And so what he's saying there is, listen, listen, you guys belong to the day. You're not creatures of the night. So be self-controlled. And before you leave the house, put on your spiritual clothes. Don't walk out the door spiritually naked, right? Put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of hope and salvation. Why are we allowed to do this? Why are we called to do this? Because we've been equipped, right? And guess what? When you walk outside the doors, even in the house, but outside the doors, do you not know we're in spiritual warfare? Like you, your mind would be blown and my mind would be blown if we could see actually how many demons and how many things are coming at us constantly that the enemy's throwing at us. That's why we got, man, and he's telling the Thessalonians, look, you have to make sure you're doing this, right? Verse nine, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 10. Who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. So he's saying, hey, Thessalonians, listen. You guys need to wake up. Some of y'all still sleeping. Some of y'all still out there getting trashed. You need to wake up and you need to start living as children of the light. Because your actions are causing others to stumble. I look at it like this, Right? We may be the only Bible someone ever reads. Think about it. We may be the only Bible someone ever reads. They hear we're Christians and they're like, well, I don't know, but I've been burnt from church. I don't know if I want to get back into church. Let me see how this guy acts. And listen, yeah, we're not perfect. And, and, and we will never reach perfection until the end of the race. But we're free. And, and, and let me tell you, fam. Hey, we don't, we're not to use that freedom for sinning, for evil, for bad things. No, we're to use that freedom to encourage each other and to tell other people about Jesus and let them know that the freedom that we experience is a freedom from chains, is a freedom from bondage of the old person and that they don't have to go through that anymore. That's our witness. That's our witness. And so uh, I love this quote because this is so good, so good on, on so many levels. It says, your daily activity should come from your new identity. Your daily activity, what you do daily, should come from your new identity. And where's your new identity found? In who? In Jesus, right? In Christ alone, my cornerstone. Like, hey, y'all don't want me to start singing for you, but, but, but you know what I'm saying? We sing these songs talking about our new identity, but do any of us really act like we have a new identity? Or are we still acting like 
the old gnarled up person like we used to be. And so here's the deal. If we're going to act like wolves, we can't do that alone. There's three different things that, that we must need in, in order to properly act like wolves. And the first one is we need to be a part of a pack, a pack, not a pact, but a pack, P-A-C-K. We need to be a part of a pack. So what's that mean? We need to do life with each other. You are not meant to do life alone. None of us in here are meant to do life alone. I don't know if you've heard it much here at Discovery Church, but we talk quite a bit about doing life together. And God's plan was not meant for us to do life alone. There's a lot of tragic stories that happen when you try and do life alone. Look at Tom Hanks and Castaway. My man lost his mind. He created a friend, right? Which, by the way, I don't know if you knew it, but the same, uh, the same uh, volleyball that was in Castaway was also in Top Gun. Did you know that? No, I'm just lying. I'm kidding. I'm just making fun. But, but no, but, but he, he like... He, lo he, he started losing his mind, right? It was all good. He's on a desert island by himself. And all the husbands were like, whoo, right? But then what happened? Paradise got lonely. We're not called to do life alone. We're called to do it together. There's a reason a pack travels strong. There's a reason they, 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 they are close-knit together. You know, when they go out hunting, you know who they look for? The prey they look for? They don't attack a big herd of things. They look for the little scraggler that's out there by themselves, right? The lame one, the sick one. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier to pray. You know what the enemy looks for when he goes out hunting? The one that's by himself. Yeah. Listen, the most healthiest time in the church is when believers are coming together within community sharing each other's burdens, praying for each other. Listen, Pastor Tim and I and, and Pastor Roly and, and we, we love you, and, and Pastor Jim, we love you, and we want to come and, and we want to pray for you and do whatever we can for you. But we're not the only ones in the church that can do that. Amen? There is a, what happens when you start doing life together, you now have a group of people, Christ followers, who can also come and pray for you and visit you at the hospital and bring you meals. And, and that's, what, that's what it should look like, right? That's, that's what happened in the early church, right? They were equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. And what is the work of the ministry? Doing life together, caring for each other. Iron sharpens what? Iron. Studies show that the top five people that you hang out with normally, and, and, and most of the time the top five people that you hang out with, are, are the people that you start to look like and you start developing habits from them and traits. And if those top five people aren't Christ followers, I don't care how strong you are, before you know it, you're going to be slipping in to some nasty sin that you can't get out of. Listen, yes, Jesus went to the bars and the, and, and, and the, the whorehouses and, and he ate with tax collectors and this and that, but y'all ain't Jesus, right? And not only that, last time I checked, he had 12 men around him who were believers and followers, and that's who he spent the most time with, correct? And so who are you spending time with? What does your pack look like right now? Listen, if you are not part of a pack, if you are not part of a small group, there's tables out there, go find one, sign up. There's all kinds of small groups for all kinds of walks, smells, flavors, taste. You got young kids, we got one for that. You got old kids, we got one for that. You're a young couple, we got ones for that, right? We got you. Just ladies, got you. Got you. So listen, join a pack. Ruyard Kipling, who's the author of The Jungle Book, had to say this about the pack. He says, the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. You're only as strong as your pack, fam. Listen, get together, have meals, fellowship, do life together. You're not in this alone. Stop acting like it, okay? Second thing, second thing we need to do if we're gonna act like a wolf, we need to be mindful of our posture. Everybody say posture. Posture. This is a hard one for me because I, uh, I slump, I walk around slouched, and uh, my posture stinks, right? It's horrible. 
if you were to look at me just walking around normally, you'd be like, this guy's a slob. Like, look at his posture, right? Right? And, do, and, and, and here's what happens. In order to fix our posture, a lot of us really just need to be adjusted. So what do we do? We go to the chiropractor, and he, he gets us right back into posture. He gets us right back into line. Here's the deal, fam. We've been walking around slumped and slouched over for way too long. You need to get with the chiropractor. And who that, who's that chiropractor? Jesus. Jesus. Listen, the answer is always Jesus. In church, the answer is always Jesus, right? I tell the kids this all the time. Listen, it's always Jesus. Trust me. It's all about Jesus. It's always going to be Jesus. And so some of us need to go visit the chiropractor, Jesus, and have him give us a couple cracks and put us back into, into place. Because I said it before, I'll say it again. You might be the only Bible someone reads, and if you walk around defeated and looking like you got rest and boo-boo face, let me tell you what, fam. Let me tell you what. People aren't going to want that. They don't want to know your God. They don't want to know that. No, our, my God is, is the God that, that set me free. He took my chains, right? But here's what happens. A lot of us were walking around like Jacob Marley, right? We're walking around like Jacob Marley with just chains rattling. You guys ever seen A Christmas Carol, right? Right? So there was a new one that was, that was made by FX, and they focus a lot on Jacob Marley and, and how in bondage he is and how heavy his chains are from his life that he's carrying around. And his mission is to get through to Scrooge to say, hey, listen, wake up or this is your life. Fam, if you are a Christ follower, you no longer have those chains. Stop walking around like you do. Let the chains fall. Amen? Listen, we walk around way too often defeated. And you know where that comes from? First thing in the morning most of the time. We're defeated before we even leave the house. Why? Because a couple things went wrong and we let that ruin our whole day. And we say, ah, things will get better tomorrow. Things will be better tomorrow. I don't know how you measure your tomorrow, but if it's by a sunrise, sunset, let me tell you this. Astronauts that are way up there orbiting the space, they see 16 sunrises and sunsets in the span of our day. They don't let that stop them. Listen, your day is not ruined by, by something that happens in the morning or happens mid-afternoon. No, if we're going to do like Mike says and, and we're going to think like wolves, we have to let our minds be renewed and we have to tell ourselves that we're not going to let our circumstances dictate our outcomes. Amen? So, so here's the deal. A little while ago, I asked you guys to do this. Let's put this into a little bit of a perspective. A little while ago, I was up here, I asked you to do this exercise. I said, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And people clapped, right? And I said, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, right? And we clapped again. I said, all right, y'all ready? I said, if, you ha if you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy, you know it, clap your hands. And then I dropped the mic and I walked off. No, I didn't do that. But, right? And then y'all started tweeting about how awesome that was. And man, Mike burnt, Pastor Mike burned us. And it's like, no, I didn't do that, right? That's not me. I didn't do that. But it was one of those moments, I know for me, when I first heard that, wow, what is my face showing, right? Do I look defeated? Because honestly, I'm telling you, you walk around defeated, no one's going to want to be with you. They're not going to want to hang out with you. And if you tell them you're a Christian, they're probably going to be like, yeah, I figured that. Why? Because Christians are way too good at looking defeated. And let me tell you what, we serve a God who has already given us the victory. Amen? Posture. Next thing, the last thing, part three or number three. If we're going to act like wolves, we need to focus on our pregame, our pregame. So when I say pregame, I don't know what comes to mind to you, but I think about when I used to go to the, the, the Daytona 500 or uh, the Bud Shootouts, and before you even go into the track, you're in the parking lot, and we, our version of pregaming was we were, we were putting down some cold beverages, cold adult beverages, right? And, uh, and we were hooping and hollering. We were early, right? Some of you guys, whoever, who's ever done a pregame, like at a football stadium or a baseball stadium or at a car track, it's okay, listen, hey, if you can't be honest in here, my friend, we got some issues, right? Because, listen, we're all a bunch of jacked up people that are in need of a Savior, right? And that have been forgiven and have received grace. And that's the old self, and it's okay to think about where we were at. But a lot of us, man, we're, we're all about pre-gaming, and we'll show up early for that sporting event. But when it comes to a worship uh, service on Sunday morning, 
we're rolling in five, ten minutes late. My dad once told me, if you show up late to something, it, it looks like it doesn't matter to you. Now, there's circumstances where they make us late. But if we really want to be somewhere, we're going to make sure we leave the house extra early to get there early or on time. If we want a seat somewhere, we're going to make sure that we leave early to get that seat. And so we're real good at pre-gaming and, and, and showing up for early, to early for things that have no eternal value. But I want to change our way of thinking, and I want us to think of a pre-game like this. Look at what author Nate uh, Blakesley wrote. He wrote this in this book called American Wolf. This guy spent seven years living amongst wolves and studying them. And, and you know what? The wolves didn't eat him. Like they welcomed him into the pact, right? Kind of like how Mowgli was welcomed in, like on Jungle Book, right? And, and did you ever notice, like think about that. No other group welcomed in Mowgli in the Jungle Book. Not the giraffes, not the elephants, not the lions, not the hyenas. Who, who welcomed Mowgli in? The wolves, right? Bagheera's like, hey, bet, I know, who will, I know who will take you in, despite what you look like. And who wanted to kill him the whole time? Shere Khan. It's okay, y'all can talk, man, it's okay. Shere Khan wanted to get him. He wanted to eat him. Why? Because he wasn't an animal. He was a man, right? And so he was ready to gobble him up, but the wolves protected him. And so it's awesome that Nate Blakesley could live amongst these wolves for seven years. And he wrote this about what they would do in their pregame. He said they would often gather to howl before setting off on nightly hunts, apparently as kind of a morale-boosting exercise, right? Then he says, this type of howl often follows a rally, an exuberant display of affection in which wolves leap on one another and... Form a furry pile of tail wagging bodies. Now, when I talk about pre-gaming, I'm not saying we need to jump all over each other and form a body of furry bodies, right? Different, different message, different Sunday, okay? What I'm saying today is before we go out on the hunt, before we take the field, we need to get fired up. And where it starts, it doesn't start here on Sunday. It starts Monday, it starts Tuesday, Wednesday, before you leave the house, you need to get a pregame ritual. You need to be encouraged and equipped before you leave that house and before you walk into spiritual warfare. I was talking to uh, one of our buddies. He's on SWAT, and we were doing this parent small group on Wednesday nights. Man, we just, we, we love our parents. And while our students are getting poured into, we, I pour into the parents, go over similar material. And I said, you know, we're talking about this concept. I said, hey, man, when you get a call for SWAT, do you just show up in a pair of boxers and a, and, a, and, a, and a tank top? He's like, no, why would I do that? I'm like, well, what do you wear? He's like, dude, I got, depending on the call, I got my, 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 my vest on, I got my helmet, I got my gun, I got this, I got that, I got smoke things. I'm like, so you show up ready for war? He's like, yeah. I was like, then why do we every day leave the house naked, right? Why, why is it that we don't put any thought into the war that we're going through? The reason that we're so beat up at the end of the day is because we walked outside naked. We forgot our pants, right? We are spiritually naked. And so what we need to do is in the morning, you need to put on the full armor of God. Find it in Ephesians 6, read it. It's amazing. The full armor of God. Because I guarantee you, you wouldn't walk out the, out the house without a, a shirt or your, pant, your regular pants, right? You're going to make sure you're covered up. Spiritually, make sure you're covered up as well. So what does your pregame look like? That's my question to you. What does your pregame look like? Here's what I think about Sundays. You ready? Sunday, that's our pregame for the, the big game that's, hap that's about to happen the rest of the week. Because this isn't the game. This is the locker room. This is where we're encouraged, where we're equipped. So when we go out and take the field, we know what's happening. We know the plays, right? And, and man, we are ready. We are psyched. We are pumped. If you've ever been part of a sports teams, those, those huddles before you go out and take the field, they're insane. Look up a couple of them. Just look up huddles before big games. Every week is a big game for us. This right here is our pregame. And, and, and here's what, I'm going to go a little bit further. If this is the only pregame you have all week, then let me tell you something. You're going to be defeated. 
you need to pregame every morning before you leave the house. So I'm going to leave you with this. Finish up this message with, with this. Uh, it's very simple. I want you to know, listen, I'm not calling you to pretend like something you're not. I'm not asking you to go out and fake the funk and to act like you're a Christian. I'm calling you, I'm, telling, I'm, I'm asking you to go out and to look, act as if you've been saved, right? Because if you've been set free, right? If you've been set free, then we should act like it. Amen? Then we should act like it, right? And I'm not calling you to be phony and I'm not calling you to live like something you're not. I'm calling you to live like someone God says you are and you are loved, you are forgiven. And you know what we're called to do with that? We're called to go out and to love and to forgive. It's not hard. He's not saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. No, 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 no. Jesus said, hey, hey, listen, check this out. Here's the greatest commandment. You ready? Love the Lord your God with everything you have, your soul, your mind, your strength, everything. And then love your neighbor like you love yourself. You do that and the rest will fall into place. We won't have to go out and fake the funk, right? But I'm telling you, fam, for far too long, Christians have just been talking about it and not acting about it. And it's time for us to finally step up and it's time for us to act. It's time for us to apply what we hear on a Sunday to the rest of our week. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be equipped. I want you to be ready for what the enemy has for you all week because guess what? Oh, he's got some nasty plans. He's got some nasty plans and I want y'all to be protected. I want y'all to be protected. I love what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. He says this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is why we should go out and act as if we've been set free. This, because of Jesus. You know why we should act like we've been set free? Is because we have been set free. Amen. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Man, do we not sing that quite often? And that's why I said at the beginning when I came out for announcements, hey, let's not just sing these hollow words. Let's really mean them and let's really act on them. And this week, I wanna leave you with this. This week, I want, I want you to, to ponder this. Today's not wasted, by the way. This week isn't wasted. This month isn't wasted. If you failed on your, uh, your, your whatever, your New Year's Eve thing, your whatever, it's not wasted. There's a brand new day. It's a brand new week. But I want you to think about this. How have you been acting? Legitimately, how have you been acting? And then I want you to get along with God. And, and, and listen, I'm not saying this, that someone I haven't even already told myself, I have 10 fingers pointing right back at me, right? I have 10 fingers pointing at me. I have to check myself daily how I've been acting. We're ambassadors of Christ and it's time for us to start acting like that. Let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder that none of us in here are perfect. None of us in here have it together. No, no. Father, we come up short multiple times a day, but you don't give up on us. You don't say, ah, I'll, I'll forgive them tomorrow. Your mercies are new, constantly new. And so thank you for having grace with us. Let us go out. God, let us be unashamed of the gospel. Let us, let us go out and just preach your love to people, not hate, not condemnation, not judgment. None of that's for us. All you said was to love them and forgive them and welcome them back into the family. Just as wolves welcome back in their, they welcome in stray cubs who have no place to go. God, you welcome in stray peeps who have been out by themselves, wandering in the wilderness for so long. So thank you for the reminder of your love, of your grace, of your mercy. Let us not just be hearers of your word this week, but be doers and apply and to go out and act like Jesus, to act like a wolf. We 
love you. We thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. In the name of Jesus.